Hi everyone, Edric here from the Epic Podcast. Thanks again for joining us in Edric Poon and Company, the podcast where anybody can inspire everybody. This week, we've got Marilyn Eng, the director of Made Coal. Now, she's been traveling quite a while and we've chatted very nicely about ideation, about the challenges of starting a business, especially in cold brew coffee. So if you love cold brew coffee and you want more of that in Singapore, you got to listen to her. Please enjoy. So uh, anyway, so how was your day? What did you do today? Uh, we had a launch this morning uh, with a private client uh, for a big retail store launch and we made some products for them. But then we found out that there's a couple of issues. So I've been rushing around just to make sure that the issues are okay. Oh, and then wow. we also just had a, uh, a launch of a new cafe at the same time. This is the first time that we are kind of partnering with the cafe, helping them to set it up. So it's a first for the company because uh, we're a Cobra company, but this is the first time because of what's happening in the market right now. We just want to see what are the new avenues, you know, of business in terms of concept that we can do. Mm-hmm. So we helped the cafe, which is a restaurant actually, and uh, they only operate in the evening. So we decided to turn the day cafe, the, the, the rest of the day into a cafe. Ooh. And so we helped them to set it up. And uh, we set up the espresso machine. So now we are kind of like doing whole beans, you know, bottle cold brew and tap cold brew as well. So, so it's, it's uh, because they've just uh, started a soft launch. So we are slowly uh, testing out the market. And so I go often quite a fair bit to, to do that just to see how they're doing. Would you be able to just tell us a little bit more about Made Cold? Okay, uh, so we are Make Coal. It's a co brew company here in Singapore. So we started about four and a half years ago uh, when I first returned to Singapore. And so we are the first, I would say, in Singapore four and a half years ago to be a commercial uh, co brew uh, manufacturer. And so we primarily do uh, B2B sales. Uh, servicing uh, cafes, uh, co-working spaces, hotels, uh, you know, with co-brew needs. Uh, We did a lot, when we first started, we did a lot of uh, OEM, which is white label bottling. And then we gradually realized that we want to do something uh, like a Singapore brand and to really showcase a brand that is here in Singapore. Uh, We wanted to uh, to say, hey, you know what, buy Make Cold's product. Uh, we still do a lot of events right now. So we, the company has then uh, a, a switch to do events and continue to do a lot of B2B businesses and trying to uh, reach out to the B2C clients, you know, through our Cobra bottles. <laughs> when we first launched a product, uh, we started with one product and it's black coffee, no sugar. And that was very difficult you know, to sell. But I think over the four and a half years, um, everybody here in Singapore probably would know more more or less what cold brew is. Mm. Um, And for those who doesn't know, cold brew basically is using coffee and water, um, natural water and really clean water uh, to really soak it uh, in big brewing tanks uh, for over about 12 to 18 hours overnight. And then after that, we have to drain the products and then we bottle it or we cag it so for our company we have uh, one product and we do it in many different styles so the idea is to really help people uh, restaurants or businesses uh, who are looking to ease the manpower and to be able to have one core product and make it into different recipes and we wanted to showcase that coffee can be delicious without sugar and healthier and we wanted to reach out to people that, hey, you know, cold brew is really a, a product that's more concentrated and you can drink it, especially Singapore weather is so hot, mm. right? So you don't want to drink hot coffee because when I came back, I wanted to drink only cold drinks because the weather here is so hot. But I couldn't find a coffee that I wanted to drink because it's either so sh- full of sugar or a product that is really uh, uh, without flavor. And we wanted something that is good product um, that can be drank cold. So I thought, wow, Singapore is a great market. What do I try, you know, to start this company and uh, see if it's going to take off? So that was how I started it. 
um, with the idea that, okay, let's do a commercial product uh, I, and then started uh, a, a company that commercially uh, can produce for other cafes, uh, can also help them to ease uh, the production because my experience back in the North America where I, I, where I came from, Cobra production is very difficult and it's very finicky at the same time. It takes a lot of time, a lot of space. Uh, people may not have that ability or a trained staff to monitor the quality of the product. So if we can do it commercially and then just deliver to them in bottle or a keg for a nitro coffee, then that is the ideal solution for a proprietor to buy from us. And then they can just use it as a recipe. You can use it for a uh, cocktail even. So this is what we're doing right now. Something I've always wanted to know is that what is the perspective of, you know, those who have left the country and those that came back, mm -hmm. you know, is there an outside in perspective that we can learn? So uh, maybe you could go into that a little bit more, you know, um, you were born in sure. Singapore. I was born in Singapore and grew up here. And I think as a child, I was very active and creative. I've never really kind of excel well here in Singapore. So I, I, I think looking back, it's been a great, uh, I think it's great that I actually left. I'm not sure. I, I don't think you can look back and think about whether that's a right or wrong decisions. But at a very young age, I realized that Singapore probably is not the country where I will be for a long time. I didn't really think about that I will actually be here. I, I, it, it's quite surprising that I am here right now at this time. And I constantly do reflect a lot about being here in Singapore. I left and I kind of spent a lot of my time over 20 somewhat years overseas, predominantly uh, in Canada. And I spent a lot of time as well in London and also in the United States. Um, and of course I travel here and there a lot to, to do uh, work and also consulting work uh, in the coffee industries internationally and I came back so I think coming back here definitely it's a culture shock I'm Asian but not really Asian at the same time and my mentality and thought process are very different and the market here and the people here are also very different uh, having to really learn about the culture if I'm doing business locally and with local businessmen uh, if they're very predominantly Chinese older man, it's quite hard because it's the concept of unspoken words that you have to understand. Mm. They are not very direct, I think, you know, but I am very thankful that um, for business wise, uh, Make Hold works a lot with very open minded and international companies. So, in that sense, things are quite direct. But if I work with the smaller businesses, then I have to really think about the unspoken words uh, about what they mean when they say something or when they don't say something, when am I supposed to guess what they are supposed to say? I think for me, the hardest is really communication, mm. which is not very simple and not very direct. Right. And, and, it, it, and I think that's harder, hardest for me. Yeah. Right. And, uh, so what you, do you think? You've, you've done business all oh, for me. Well, um, yeah, doing regional jobs, right? It's definitely been yes. very different. You know, every yeah. place has its own culture. I mean, not right. not not so much the mince words or anything like that, but um, like what you mentioned, you know, uh, traditionally, even in writing, uh, business books will tell you that uh, uh, the Chinese in general always have this thing about guanxi, the the relationship Correct. aspect of things. You know, the Japanese also have a certain culture. You know, yes. uh, but the thing is that these were books that were written 10, 20 years ago at least. Um, but I'm not too sure how much of that still exists at this point in time. Uh, I do think that there's a certain level of openness that has grown over the years. Yes. At the same time, yes, uh, there's a certain um, conservativeness, if you wanted to call it that, when it comes to uh, dealing in the East. But for you, right, when, I mean, you started out your business, uh, where was that? In London? Was that where you started or was that in Canada? Uh, in Canada, actually. Right. And that was, yes, what, what was that about? I, how did that happen? I actually was in the fashion business way, way before. And so when I moved there, a friend of mine challenged me and say, um, they, they gave me a task to say, well, Canada, it's not really a fashion capital in what I was doing. I was doing buying um, and also designing work as a merchandiser. And when I moved to Canada, I wanted to switch industry. And so I started from the ground up 
you know, working in a cafe. What I love about it is people are very embracing. And I started working in a cafe um, and I met amazing, wonderful people. And that gives me the desire, you know, I think the, the desire to like to be in service of other people because I find that people tell you their life story. So when they buy a cup of coffee, it's not just a cup of coffee to go. You became friends mm. with your clients. You became neighbors. You became families, you know, with the people that you serve. So that, that's, the, the, that's the best part for me in my job. And, and I find that people are so embracing. They constantly champion you to want to do well. And so from there, I just, I just uh, expanded my knowledge in the coffee business and also my desire to want to do more beyond just working in a coffee shop. Uh, I started roasting coffee at the same time. So I think the culture, it's more embracing for me in Canada and it's also uh, very inspiring because they really like to see immigrants right thrive in a way and I had a huge great community you know um, that champions around me in what I do to where I learned you know eventually to England too I had a great experience as well so yeah so after that you headed over to London Yes, I headed over to London and uh, I was working in the coffee academy and eventually work with some of the clients to help them to train some of their uh, corporate accounts. And that corporate accounts uh, eventually gives me a lot of international gigs to travel internationally to help people to look at their businesses and open cafes at the same time. So this is what I learned about coffee competition, being a judge in coffee competition, buying and selling coffee, uh, understanding the, the nuances of tastes, you know, just like wine tasting. Um, so I learned, I accumulate uh, the business, the desires to really say, hey, you know, I like business. I like starting businesses and I like coffee business. But I think those skills can be for a lot of businesses at the same time. It's just that my industry happens to be in the coffee business. I came back, uh, I, I came back to Singapore, um, didn't start a coffee business right away. I came back here because I was uh, kind of like hit hunted mm. uh, back into the fashion industry while I was in New York. Um, so when I came here, I've always had the idea that I love to start a business uh, eventually but I and I love the cold brew business because I've enjoyed drinking it and it is something so delicious um, but I didn't know how and I didn't know when because that was not my background in production and it is only one product so when I came here starting to do the project that I was given the job to do I started going to cafes naturally I started talking to people. I started meeting uh, shop owners and people that I knew when I was doing a research again a few years back in Singapore about the coffee business uh, for a client. I was doing consultancy for a client to see if they should be opening up an office here in Singapore or Hong Kong. So I was doing the Asian tour at that time. So I still have a lot of contacts for businesses and also business owners here in Singapore. So naturally I reach out to them and see how they are. And that just got me going and the fire in my, in my gut say, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, right? You gotta, you gotta do this. And so I thought about cold brew again because that was something I was, I was thinking and it was a project that I was thinking while well back, uh, back in New York. And so I spoke to a friend. So I said, hey, I have this idea. Why don't we just think about doing this together? What do you think? Let's start a brand and let's start having some ideation about this. So the idea was just to say, hey, let's try to see uh, if this will work. And also when I spoke to many cafes owners, they say, yeah, we've been looking for something like this. Um, nobody has a production facility. So I gathered some information and thought, okay. And they say, if you just start this business, I'll be your first client. And so we got together to think of a name and, you know, spent money on the brand and happened that there was the first coffee festival in Singapore. We went out 
and we, we started with the tap nitro coffee because we didn't have a production facilities at that time to do bottling. So having a, 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 a tap coffee is much more easy, easier to assemble. And we went. So it was a hit. Mm. It was a hit in the market. So we thought, oh, my God, we got to take this seriously. So that's when we start talking about the idea to a couple of fans. And they were all keen to invest into the business. And so we got money together and registered the company. And then, then we start looking for production space. So we got picked up by a couple of brands and we also started partnerships, you know, with, uh, with bigger brands, cafes to do their uh, product. We were the first one that created this product in an environment that you needs to be sterile at the same time. Um, products has to last because there's no preservatives, there's no chemicals, and realize that the products doesn't last beyond, let's say, five days, you know, seven days, two weeks. And that became very difficult to sell commercially because that's too short a shelf life. Mm. And so when you realize that you needed more facilities, you needed more equipment, you needed uh, a know-how lab quality checks and all this stuff, then you realize that, wow, there's so much uh, uh, finances so much money that is net needed but eventually you know from from we starting just to have a brand uh, we still didn't have make coal out but people in the industry will know who make coal is but our product were never out there because we're always doing products for other people so a lot of the cafe's products in terms of cold brew at that time were all made by us but then um, we realized that we needed to look into shelf life. We needed to look into water system, water filtration. So through very expensive mistakes that we had, we have to end up spending a lot of money on um, understanding bacteria, understanding humidity in Singapore, understanding logistics, how things travel and how they react with the temperature and learning what kind of logistical need we need in terms of warehousing and how the products are being stored and how are they being delivered to how they are being produced. So we spent quite a lot of our finances to learn those mistakes and then ending up that uh, we, we work with a lab, we work you know, with R&D team, uh, that is with the universities, and figure out how we can do a product with better shelf life. So then we can then sell the product uh, to bigger markets at the same time. Right. And were there any times, you know, uh, during this journey, I mean, the way you make it sound is like everything was so smooth sailing, you know, and it it's not, of course, it not sounded really easy in some ways. But were there times right, where you just going, ah, man, this is not worth it. I think as an entrepreneur, you have to ask yourself why you want to do a particular business. Uh, it's not a journey for everybody, for sure. I think entrepreneur is one of the hardest things for people because you do have to make a lot of sacrifices. Um, are there days, often there are days when I think about, of course, I don't want to do it, but my gut feeling is it's not time yet. My passion is coffee, of, of course, but it's always about community. Is the the people that I meet along the way, and and the and the partnership that I forms, and also the people that I serviced, that gets me going. It, it's what gets me going is maybe the ideation of certain things, and really wanting to see not something to be created out of nothing. And what's your next milestone then for your company? The next milestone is we want to think about a concept, you know, like Make Coal, it's a coal brew company. So we did, we are trying, we're going to go online right now. Um, and we have done in the last six months. So we, we want to partner with a lot of companies and we, we are still learning in the process to think that we're going to have an online offering. We're going to try to create a, um, limited editions product uh, therefore it will always be interesting to client uh, we want to continue to offer um, uh, businesses an opportunity to partner with them in in the cafe's offerings in the sense that this is what we have done the first one recently is where we set up the entire shop for them meaning from roasted coffees to bottled drinks to tap 
So, and this type of business is very rare because tap system is very expensive as well. So either you are already a tap room, meaning you have taps for your beers or, you know, for, so you need a cold room. So we will tap into those business or have to think about businesses that are like that and then do a proposal for them uh, and think about whether or not can we uh, convert our business into fast moving uh, product that you take a uh, lesser manpower, but you can be giving someone that is a very good product, just like having wine on tap. You know, wine is always in the bottle, but now you think about wine on tap. So make whole have to really think about whether or not we want to include uh, alcohol in, you know, in our coffee. We come out with recipes and we <laughs> sell coffee. that as event. <laughs> Irish coffee, it's basically, yeah, you know, but it's hot version. So what about the cold brew version, right? What is a cold brew uh, product cocktail they can think about, you know, like cold brew Negroni, you know, um, we can have cold brew tonic, right? So those are very exciting, delicious products. So so we wow. want to offer, correct, so you have cold brew tonic on tap or just having a tap. So we, we want to think about that. But of course now, uh, uh, so that was what we were working towards. Uh, before, of course, COVID started. So we're pitching right. to hotels to say, hey, how, how about we help you to do your volume business, um, but it's all on tap. So you can do your, you know, your big corporate event and all the big trade shows, you know, and we can do a day service and a night service. So the day right. service will be your coffee and tea on tap or bottle. Um, and then the evening service, we turn it into a cocktail. Right. On did tap. you ever watch that episode of Shark Tank, right? There was this one on beers. What they did was that um, it's fit for any home. You can put a growler, you can put a bottle in of beer and yeah. basically it comes out like draft and it's all battery operated. Yeah. You can't yeah, imagine yeah, yeah. that with cold brew though. Imagine taking any coffee and just making yeah. it in the cold brew or at least turning it, I don't know, just running it through a very cold process and making it happen. There are, of course there are, right? So, so you can do that. Of course there are, so that's what we want. That's what we are doing. But we're still we're still a B two B business, right? And so so where we do all of that because our quantities are very large. So it's an interesting idea to think about how do you take cold brew into someone's home. Mm. So right now we're only doing a bottle. But what about tap system? Yeah. Can we offer? Yeah. You know, like you say, cold brew on tap home, and what kind of gadgets do we need? Uh, there are there are there are businesses already doing that, or there are equipments already doing that, right? But you need cold storage. The problem here is not about uh, the product, about storage. Right. You you do need cold storage. So cold storage for a lot of people in their home are limited to their refrigerator. Right. And, and here space in Singapore, um, in your HDB house, right. it's quite small, right? And not say small, I, I don't think it's small, but I think that space are quite uh, dedicated to a certain way of living. But, right. And again, you, you need a certain type of demographic to say, oh yeah, this is great. We're going to have a party at home. I think it can be done. Uh, uh, of course, that is something that uh, not yet, but we are really thinking more to the corporate level. That's what we were doing before. Right. Um, and we did a couple of trials already through events where we have a day, you know, where we, where we do the cold brew, uh, like, like a mocktail. We use teas and juices together and then we have themes. And then in the evening, we become the bar, right? So we offer a one-stop shop basically for all the needs. Um, so this is where we, we are uh, trying to continue the business. And also mm -hmm. when you say selling coffee beans right now, that's what we're doing because we're already roasting right. our coffees and to turn it into cold brew. So why aren't we selling them in coffee, coffee beans? So we did that during COVID and people are buying it. And also we're, we're using some of our tea leaves right, that we're doing cold brew and we're selling that as a tea leaves for home as well. Mm. We might eventually do a workshop, right, and, and offer that as workshop. But of course, cold brew workshop is harder yeah. um, because it does take about 12 to 18 hours minimal. So you can't have a product in advance, let's say two hour sessions. But the concept of what is cold brew and how to cold brew at home, uh, those are the concepts we can grow. We do have a lot of inquiries to say, would you do uh, classes, you know, would you do all this stuff? So, uh, we just, I'm just a little bit 
uh, trying to focus on our core right now and think about what are the, the way that we can continue to service our clients and how can we continue to work together with our clients. Right. And I would like to pick your brain about this thing, your love for ideation, right? How do you get everybody in the room and start to really brainstorm? I think if you are a creative person, you can just sit together and eventually something comes out. I think it's very natural process. I think if you are a creative person or people who are used to creating things or have the entrepreneurial spirit, you will just sit together and have something happen. I, I don't, it, it's just about how everyone have the certain skill sets and also, um, let's say if you get a bunch of people who loves beer, they will come up with something different, a kind of beer or a way of doing it. And then if they really have that facilities, they'll go about doing that. Or if they all are uh, in the business, but different way of doing business, they can sit together and they can say, oh, let's do this together. You know, and, and I think, uh, how do you do that? I don't think it's difficult if you are entrepreneurial. I don't think you need much help at all right? Or you, you just need one person to say, oh, I have an idea. And then if you have a group of people sitting together and everybody will, will start talking about it, like recently, I had an idea for a candle business. And I just sat down at dinner with a friend. At the end of the dinner, the name is born, the goal is born, you know, the name is born, the, 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 the slogan is born. And then at the end of the week, the logo is created. And then an online web shop has started. So it's not difficult if you are a ready enterprising and creative. It's just whether or not you have the time, you know, to, to take it into action and whether then you want to test the market to see if it's viable, I guess. Does nice. it make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Because uh, some people just believe in this whole structure of putting everything together and, uh, you know, having, oh, we have to have these parameters and must this, this, this. But sometimes the way that you're going is such a free flowing method, you know, which is exactly what um, on the creative side of things you are. You just have that idea and you start building up from there, which is a wonderful process, I have to say. One of the things that I did also like to cover, right, uh, in this whole thing is basically what do you think in your uh, mind right is your most critical skill as a business owner oof critical self awareness self understanding i think that is what is very important because i think uh, there's a lot of things that you need to make decisions and i think without understanding yourself and understanding what your values are and also your boundaries you, you need to have your own values. When you have your own values, you basically become your foundation. Is a value kindness and generosity? Is a value about profiteering to the max? Then let's say if you're somebody who wants to make the biggest buck, then you will think about any way just to make a buck, right? You can just, you know, not saying that they will cut corners, but that's what they will focus on, right? That means uh, that's how I want it. I want to get the best prize, whatever it is, may not be the best in qualities or whatever it is. And also how you treat people at the same time and knowing your strengths and your weaknesses, which is again, knowing yourself, right? Because you don't have all the skill set, You need to depend on other people. And I, I think knowing yourself, knowing who works well with you and what you need to help you to succeed and who are the people that will help you bring that vision to action. And so knowing your boundaries, what will not cross, meaning if somebody were to be, uh, uh, just have the wrong values as I am, meaning if they are just uh, bullying people, for example, right? Um, and if they don't treat people the right, if they don't uh, take care of other people, though, those are the, not the same values that I have. Then I may not choose to go that way. And then you got to think about how you want your business to, to function. So I think for entrepreneur, you need to know all those stuff. Learn about yourself. You know, learning about yourself is very clarifying, I think. All right. Thank you for that. You've been in business uh, quite a while now, moving from place to place. That's what you've mentioned earlier on. Look back maybe about five years. What do you think the biggest changes have been for you um, when you started out versus now? Being comfortable with changes being comfortable when i first started i just everything just gnaws at me every little things makes me 
you know, tense up. Every little thing makes me sleepless. Every little thing makes me stress. But when I now five years later, um, I would have to say I don't uh, get as anxious. And if there's a bad decision or bad mistakes, you look at it and say, what can I learn from it? And also, you know, uh, for me, I learned to be a little bit more calm. And I learned uh, what to say and what not to say. Who do I talk to and who do I not talk to? Who are my closest allies? And also, what do I uh, continue to find joy? And what do I continue to find uh, that is of value. I find that more and more as I learn in the business is what values are very important because if you look at that mental health right now, you know, and, and how we do businesses right now, right? People are under so much stress and so much pressure and, and we, we have to change so fast and we have to constantly go, 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 go. But what for? For what? For at what expense? So for me, I... Now I realize that I could look at things and I know that I'm okay, you know, uh, for a lot of things to happen. And I don't, uh, I don't get upset as much and I don't get as, as how should I say, turmoil. You know, um, because I think you learn, you learn by growing, right? And only when you grow, then I think that's a success. Personal well-being, I feel like now I realize are very, very important. Uh, the more, that's how you get longevity and also that's how you get your stamina, I feel. And do you feel that your current lifestyle is perfectly balanced at this point in time? Not, not, not possible. I don't think... Uh, <laughs> I don't think uh, you you will always to be balanced because there's always going to be something happening, something changing, something that needs to be worked at. Uh, uh, this constant, I think, as an entrepreneur and a self-employed person as well, right? Um, there's not a day that your mind is not thinking. There's not a day that your mind is not ticking. You do have to make a conscious effort to stop and say, "I got to stop." Otherwise, you won't stop. Because some other things you might think about right now and some other projects might come up, some other conversations will come up, some other things that needs to solve and uh, people you need to talk to, uh, things you need to read. Uh, so it's always learning how to say stop and it's okay. Um, and it's not going to be the end of the world. But I don't think you'll ever find balance. Um, I don't think I don't know how people do it when they have family, and I think uh, I think you need a team of people to really make it work, you know. And you you need to learn how to delegate, and you need to learn how to let go, and and that it doesn't have to be perfect, and it's going to be okay because sometimes things work it work itself out at the same time. Right, that's a very interesting thought. I I would figure that you'd be downing like your a lot of coffee since you have it at uh, you know your disposal but like what they say don't get high off your own supply yeah yeah <laughs> for sure you know so, cold yeah. brew is very high in caffeine actually <laughs> it, is, it is that's what got me hooked in the first place and I thought oh, I, the really? first time I had cold brew a couple of years yes. back I still remember it was just like okay I thought it was just cold coffee I was like wow this is really nice yeah, yeah, yeah. first two sips yeah. and wow this is good and all of a sudden the kick comes in and you're like whoa yeah yeah really good so yeah. yeah, I mean, um, given the chance, if you have that cold brew, uh, uh, Negroni, count me in. I am sold. I want to try that. Sure. Right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We did all that right. a lot, actually. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, we're all alcoholics in some ways, right? Or is it, well, substance abusers. <laughs> if you're heavy <laughs> on coffee drinking, you're, yeah, alcohol is probably a solution too. Oh, they're and good they're, mixed. <laughs> uh, so up ones are upper ones and downer. I don't know what I'm going to Yeah, yeah, for that. sure, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. For sure. Lastly, yeah. lastly, right, before we move uh, into the last segment, um, what's your advice to share with anybody who might be looking to start a business on their own? Uh, to start on your own. Uh, to, to, to talk to somebody. 
to talk to somebody about the idea, uh, be challenged first in theory about the idea, think about what values do you have to what you want to create and how are you able to do it. Figure out the hardest things like how much money do you have, how much time do you have, and uh, and figure out all the potentials and also the pitfalls. And then from there, make that decisions whether you want to go for it. Do you have that risk factor, you know, because a lot of times you may end up with nothing at the same time. And then know those answers and then go for it or not go for it or test it out. What is the smallest scale you can test it out? Always test it out in a small scale. And then from there, you will learn. Is that too big a task for you or does it get you even more excited? Yeah, I like that very much. Making sure that you really test out and do all these small little experiments. Yes. As you go along, test the market, test yourself. I think that's really yes. good. All right. Thanks, sure. Marilyn. Thanks so much for um, uh, sharing so much. You know, uh, it was really, really a, an amazing coverage of what you've uh, shared today. Now, I'd like to, um, you know, bring you in to this little rapid fire session that I normally have with all my guests at the end of the, oh, the, end dear. Of the podcast. Okay. <laughs> so it's a couple of questions that I have for you. Um, yes. So Marilyn Ng, are you ready? Sure, go for it. Okay, Marilyn Eng with the epic questionnaire. Question one, one word that you love the most? Kindness. One word that you dislike the most? Selfishness. <laughs> if you can have a conversation with one person, fictional, non-fictional, dead or alive, who would that be? Uh, that's a guy that I know is called Bob Jeff or Bob Joff. That he, that's the person I want to have a conversation with. He's alive. And what would you want to ask? How does he continue to share joy and what makes him want to share joy? Wonderful. And what do you say to yourself in the morning every day? You are loved, you are precious, and you can help other people and you learned through it. What's your usual coffee order? Black coffee. Black coffee. No sugar. Over hot. Sugar. No sugar. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite dish to eat? Ooh, fried chicken. Fried chicken. Mm. Yeah. Favorite travel spot? Ooh, anywhere that has nature. And uh, what's your next travel spot then, once borders open up? Ooh, depending how much time I have. That's a nature farm. Uh, it's like a reserve in Thailand if that's only like three, four days or to go to Canada, to go back to Canada. Lovely. And mm -hmm. something in the arts that you've always wanted to do but didn't I, I was a potter and I think I will be a, I, I would love to be able to restart that and dedicate uh, time to do pottery again. What does retirement look like to you? I think retirement is a word for me. I think I'll always be looking for something to do and and finding things that I am excited to do uh, and to contribute to sharing, I guess. How do you want to be remembered? What is your legacy? How do I want to be remembered? Um, to be kind and to share and to be generous and to love well. All right, and that's the end of the epic questionnaire. Uh, Marilyn Eng, please stay on the line. All right. And yes. ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for joining us on this week's episode of the Epic Podcast, right? With <laughs> me and Marilyn Eng, Made Cold. So if Thank you're you. liking this information, you like this content, please do me a favor, like, subscribe, comment, do what you need to do. Tell us how we're doing. And I hope that you'll join us again next week. Thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.